Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of May 15, 2014. I'm City Council President Greg White. I'm presiding. Um, tonight, uh, for those of you who are interested in having a pre sale of the meeting, we're principally going to, the biggest item is the mayor is going to be pre presenting his budget. We're not voting on the budget. The budget will eventually be sent to public hearings that the, we will notify the public once we figure out what, when those meetings will be. Um, but it's kind of a big deal, given the fact that it's one, one of the, the most, if not the most important thing that we do. Uh, before we convene, uh, we uh, traditionally have the public comment section, which is uh, just before the council meeting. And you can speak on any topic. Uh, it doesn't have to be relevant to what's on the agenda tonight, but with these caveats, uh, please keep your remarks under three minutes and there'll be a timer so, right about there. And we'll count you down. And um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, um, we ask that when you step up, you state your name and your address um, for the record. And also, please consider your comments uh, when you're making them, uh, please do not comment or name people, private people by name or their addresses because they are not public figures. You, however, on the other hand, as I've said before, you're welcome to libel the bejesus out of us if you're interested because we're, we're amenable to that. Well, we're not amenable to it, we're just susceptible <laughs> to it. So starting up on the list, I have Catherine Morish, please. Do I get my address? Um, yes, if, if you just restate your name and give your address. And, and by the way, I should also, uh, one thing I didn't know was that the council's not allowed to respond or answer any questions that you may ask, just so you know. I get to speak clearly, but <laughs> I won't. Uh, so yes, if you could just, Catherine, just for the record, state your name and your address, please. My name is Catherine Morris, and I live at 9 Prospect Heights, Northampton. Thank you. I'm going to read this instead of talk. Cause That's I'm fine. Shorter. That's perfectly fine. The spraying of synthetic pesticides on trees is known to be dangerous to humans and animals. Cancer hospitals such as Sloan Kettering have long warned of the dangers of pesticides. This exposure is cumulative and can cause cancer, damage to neonatal development, endocrine disruptors, and possibly Parkinson's disease. Neighbors are, not, are often not notified and passers-by, including young children on their way to the Jackson Street School, which I saw last week, are in danger of chemical exposure. Residents of this thickly settled neighborhood are also being exposed to chemicals which are not yet proven safe. We all want to protect our trees, but spraying is, da but sp but is spraying dangerous chemicals into urban neighborhoods really the best or even acceptable way to do this. Many state agricultural agencies recommend elimination or minimization of synthetic pesticides. I'm not making any horticultural suggestions as to how to protect our trees. I'm not an expert in that area. I do suggest that we suspend tree spraying until recommendations as to the best methods to proceed are obtained from specialists at the University of Massachusetts. Last week, the American Lung Association gave Hampshire County a failing smog grade. Do we really want to add more chemicals to this already dangerous level of pollution? I am deeply concerned about protecting the most vulnerable who do not have a voice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you, we have your letter submitted into the public record as well. Thank you. Um, Barbara Rakoshka, please. Good evening. I'm Barbara Rakaska of 571 Florence Road. Thank you for allowing the public to speak. I think this is great in a democracy. Um, I do want to thank Peter Colcott and Senator Rosenberg for getting money in the budget for the Florence Road and Ryan Road intersection. It's a very dangerous intersection. And for nine years, City Councilor Marianne Labarge and I and the mayor, when he was on the Transportation Committee, have been to many meetings. There have been design studies done, and now there is money in the budget for it. 
It's a very dangerous intersection with people crossing at the crosswalk to go to the convenience store. That, that I don't know if you know Florence Road and Ryan Road, but there's a steep hill that comes down around a tur curve right to a crosswalk. And cars are ha now, with more traffic, having a hard time even turning out of Ryan Road. That it, and kids are walking to the convenience store from the Heights and other areas. There's sidewalks and they can't get across the streets. What I'm asking for is if the mayor and possibly the city council, I don't know what, how you could do this. Last year, $200,000 was budgeted. And I don't know what happened with that money, whether the governor let it out, which I don't think he did, for this intersection. Now there's another $75,000 in the budget, and it does say for the Florence Road dangerous intersection. And I am just pleading if the mayor could advocate for the city to ha that the governor doesn't scratch that from the budget and that it gets released. So that's a total of 270000 75000 in my mind that could be working to get that intersection made safe before a child is killed, before there's more accidents. A car has already hit a house. So it really needs to be done. The money's there. We need to plead to keep it there and have it in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Jasper Lapienski, please. Hello, my name is Jasper Lapienski. I live at 226 South Street. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about the change to council rules regarding suspension of Rule 3. For anyone who can hear me but doesn't know what Rule 3 is, it's the rule that allows councillors to vote on whether to suspend or sidestep other rules that govern the manner in which the council conducts itself. Currently, any majority of members present may vote to suspend rules by invoking Rule 3. This change would require two-thirds of councillors to vote in favor. whoop de la Now, for the record, I'm always in favor of more accountability in government, and I have thoroughly enjoyed watching Councillor Dwight find more and more creative ways of improving how this body does business. And to Councillor Adams, thank you for your work on this. But this is purely symbolic. The council almost always votes to suspend rules when a suspension is proposed, and whenever it does, the vote is always unanimous. Even laying that aside, you recognize that we are discussing changing the threshold of failure from five councillors opposed to suspending rules to four councillors opposed to suspending rules. Even in the event that one councillor was opposed, I simply don't see a scenario unfolding in which the body as a whole would snub that one councillor and suspend the rules anyway. This amendment is good policy, but it will have no effect whatsoever on the suspension of council rules in the future. It does serve, however, as the perfect platform for me to speak to a pet peeve of mine regarding the usage of suspension of rules privileges by the council. And that is when the act of suspending the rules violates the spirit of the rule that is being suspended. For instance, second readings. The intent behind having two readings required for all orders, ordinances, financial orders, and so on, is to permit the public to weigh in on a consequential topic after an official vote has been cast and counselors are squarely on the record. A motion to expedite the process by having both readings on the same night bypasses this safeguard completely. Likewise, the motion to waive reading. Again, for those who don't know what this means, the council president is required to read aloud in full orders, ordinances, and so forth. The purpose of this is to increase accountability among cable access viewership. Waiving the reading is certainly efficient, but it violates the principle behind the rule. In particular, waiving the reading on second reading I shut my mouth during the stormwater ordinance for Bill's mental health, but in general, the phrase two readings ought to pan out to more than a hopeful metaphor. I could make a fairly good case for why these two rules are cumbersome, cumbersome and unfair to counselors, as well as for why the public does not utilize this accountability in any meaningful way. Perhaps, perhaps it is time to address these rules head on and modernize them once and for all. In the meantime, however, I would request that you hereby cease to invoke your privilege to suspend any council rules for your own convenience when that convenience violates the spirit of the rules you are suspending, regardless of the size of the majority required to do so. Thank you. Right on the, right on the money, Jasmine. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. uh, George Brennan, please. Hi, I'm George Brennan here. I live in a tent. Uh, I hang out on the park most of the time. Plus, he parks you find me. Uh, the drugs down there are unbelievable. Nothing has been done about them. The police officers are turning in the back. Mary Ann told me she could not do anything about it because it's a federal law. I could go down to Walter Sabo, bust these apartments, they're there. I don't know if she did. She, she, she rode by me and gave me one of these. Good going, George. Right on the bun. Right? What did that mean? I have no idea. Talk to me. You know? We got to do something about these kids that are dying. When, when the drugs go out, when your kids grow up, they're going to be shooting themselves with drugs. Happy? We're going to say, Northampton did it for us. You people are really happy, aren't you? The kids are dying out here by the tons. Walter Sabo had nine or ten uh, overdoses this year. A kid walking uh, off the balcony, showing his girlfriend how, how he could walk the balcony, fell off in his head, loaded with drugs. Ain't that nice? I love it. You know? Why not just take all our kids and say, here you go, we'll set you off at one, two, three years shoot, shooting drugs, right? City Hall. I walked down there the other day and there's three people in their shade in their underwear. I said, ain't this nice? What are you guys doing here? We're shaving. We have no place to go. What's, what does it take to shut down these three people? What does it take to shut down the city hall? If it's, got, if it's got to be shut down, they shut it down. They have a bus they call the, uh, the uh, Holyoke Run bus. Cocaine. They, they, they shoot up in the bus, they throw the needles out the window, the bus drivers are turning the back. They don't want no part of this. Can you blame them? The, 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 the blue, I talked with the bus drivers on there. They're uh, two weeks on and two weeks off. They, no one would take it any longer. A lady took her clothes off and decided to walk up and down the bus aisle. No clothes on. The bus driver didn't stop, he just kept on going. Like it was, hey, this is fun. Huh? When are we going to learn to protect our kids? Huh? Tell me. It's up to us to do this. Not, not, I'm saying me, you, the rest of us. We see something, report it. Go to the police and say, look, this is this, right? Why not? I've had two threatening calls. I'm being evicted from my uh, apartment right now because I told a person. Right? I, I, I'm going to go back to my tent. I don't want this garbage. I don't need it. I can sleep in the tent just as well as I can anywhere else. I'm 66 years old. I don't deserve this. Do you? I hope so. I hope you people will join me in fighting the, the druggies in this town. A guy from Texas turned around and said to me, I heard this is the best place in the world to get money and get food. I, I know, I know. I just go one more second. I, and this, this is the best place to get food, money, and drugs. I said, where? Northampton. That's why we're up here. Four people from Texas. <clears throat> nice, huh? Now they're coming from Texas to join us. What else can we do, folks? Right? This is your fault. Thank you Thank very you. much, George. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, that's all we have signed up. Um, but if anyone else is interested in speaking right now, you're welcome to. Speak now or at least hold your peace for the remainder of the meeting. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to ask the uh, secretary to please call the roll. Councillor Adams. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Klein. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor O'Donnell. Here. Councillor Sarah. Here. Councillor Spector. Here. Excellent. Oh, okay. Computer died for just a brief second, so we're back on we're back on track. Um, there are no public hearings scheduled for today. Uh, next up would be, as you can see, the mayor and the finance director are passing out thick documents. Uh, these documents are the mayor's proposed 2015 budget, Your Honor, and and you brought a poster too. That's for later. For, I'll post it for later. Okay. Yeah. All right. We don't want, yeah, we don't want to pick pile. Okay. Okay. No, exactly. The floor is yours, Your Honor. 
Thank you. So, um, good evening, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, as is uh, required under the Charter, I'm going to now uh, read to you my budget message uh, as part of my submission of the FY 2015 budget. To the honorable members of the City Council, I submit for your consideration and approval my proposed $103,925,827 fiscal year 2015 budget for the City of Northampton in accordance with Section 7-3 of our Charter. This budget is comprised of an $85,797,556 general fund together with enterprise funds for water, $8,811,826, sewer, $6,238,128, solid waste, $1,098,261, and stormwater, $1,980,056. This budget also includes a capital improvements budget outlining 46 projects at a total cost of $8,940,739 that for the first time includes both general fund and enterprise fund projects. This budget message stands in stark contrast to the one I delivered almost a year ago today when our city was facing a $1.4 million budget gap and the potential elimination of staff and services in city departments and in our schools. On June 25, 2013, the voters of Northampton <laughs> approved a $2.5 million override as part of a multi-year fiscal stability plan designed to help us preserve vital services in FY 2014 as well as the next three fiscal years. The budget before you constitutes the second year of our plan and I am proud to report that we have made significant progress in stabilizing and strengthening our city's fiscal position. We are rebuilding <coughs> our depleted reserves. We are making much needed investments in our infrastructure, including our deteriorating streets and critical stormwater and flood control systems. We are realizing significant economic development and tax base growth. We have settled 13 of 14 collective bargaining agreements with city and school unions for FY 2015 and FY 2016. We have broken the pernicious cycle of annual cuts in our schools and the resulting emotional toll on staff and families. We are implementing a new volunteer property tax <coughs> workoff program to provide tax relief for seniors and veterans. And in March, Standard & Poor's raised our bond rating as a city to AA+, affirming that our steady work and sound fiscal policies are moving the city forward in a positive direction. My proposed general fund budget represents a 2.2% increase from fiscal year 2014. Because we settled many of our collective bargaining units after the FY 2014 budget was adopted, a significant portion of increases reflected in departmental budgets include both FY 2014 and 2015 salary increases that are in the FY 2015 budget. The general fund also reflects a sig significant changes driven by the historic creation of a new stormwater enterprise fund earlier this year. Many budget categories, particularly within the Department of Public Works, have been realigned to properly reflect the salaries and benefits, operations and maintenance costs, and charges and fees associated with operating this new public utility. We have also reviewed and revised our our formulas for indirect charges associated with all of our enterprise funds, and this budget includes a new section detailing that methodology. The five largest areas of increase in the FY 2015 general fund budget are schools. The Northampton Public Schools budget will increase $856,378, <clears throat> resulting in no cuts in staff or services for the first time in several years. NPS will also be able to fund positions to meet new state mandates while addressing reading and math challenges and technology needs at the elementary level. A significant increase of $724,088 for Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is primarily related to an increase in state recommended out of district tuition, allowing for the expansion of vocational programs, staff, and athletics. Number two, fire rescue. 
The Northampton Fire Rescue Department will see an increase of $362,981, reflecting the inclusion of retroactive salary increases for FY 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014, together with FY 2015 increases, negotiated as part of an historic six-year contract settlement reached with our firefighters last summer. The third area of increase, retirement. The city's assessment from the Northampton Retirement Board will increase $166,657 to meet the actuarial obligations for our current and future retirees and allow us to fully fund our system by 2036. This budget also funds $100,000 to establish an Other Post-Employee Benefits, or OPEB, trust fund to plan for the long-term funding of retiree benefits other than pensions, which primarily means health insurance. While we fully fund OPEB on a pay-as-you-go basis, bond rating agencies are now placing greater focus on unfunded OPEB liability as a financial management measure, and we believe building this into our budgeting is a prudent step. Number four, DPW, Parks and Recreation. Our nearly completed new Florence Fields Recreational Facility paid for through a combination of CPA funding and state grants, will require an increase of $150,549 in the DPW Parks and Recreation budget to pay for additional staff and equipment needed to maintain this expansion of the city's playing field inventory. This increase also reflects our commitment to implementing organic turf management at Florence Fields that can serve as a pilot for potential future management of all of our recreation fields. Number five, charter school tuition. Tuition for Northampton students who attend area charter schools will increase $114,911 in FY 2015. This reflects a 5.2% increase in an expense line that now tops out at over $2.3 million. While outgoing tuition will be offset by a state charter school reimbursement of $392,975, the governor and state legislature have failed to fully fund charter school reimbursements in recent years, shortchanging Northampton $106,777 in FY 2014 and a projected $139,940 in FY 2015. Northampton's overall net increase in state aid for its FY 2015 budget net increase is just 0.23% or $22,258. This falls short of even our most conservative state aid estimates and is particularly disappointing given that state revenues are projected to increase by 4.9% in FY 2015. In February, I joined city and town leaders from around the state to testify at a joint House Senate Ways and Means Committee hearing seeking an increase in state funding for these critical municipal and school aid accounts. While House and Senate budget writers did increase unrestricted general government aid, UGA, above Governor Patrick's proposed level funding of that account, our increase in Chapter 70 school aid remained at the governor's $25 per student level. This insufficient increase in school funding and the outdated Chapter 70 formula that underlies it continues to challenge Northampton's ability to meet the rising costs of educating our children costs that are largely attributable to state and federal mandates. In FY 2002, uh, excuse me, uh, in FY 2002, state aid represented 30% of our general fund budget revenues. Prior to the national recession in FY 2009, state aid had slipped to 25% of our general fund budget revenues. In the general fund budget before you, state aid now comprises only 19% of our revenues. This continuing erosion in state aid, coupled with increases in state charges to Northampton for charter school and school choice students, is one of the largest single factors affecting our revenue picture. Massachusetts cities and towns are now more reliant on regressive property taxes to fund services than at any time in the last 30 years. It is critical that we press state government for a larger share of state revenues and more local revenue authority. This November's election of a new governor after eight years is a pivotal one for our Commonwealth, and I urge all citizens to be engaged in the fall campaign to ensure that all candidates commit themselves to investing in local municipalities and schools. 
Last year, I presented the City Council and the residents of Northampton with a fiscal stability plan to conserve a significant portion of the new tax revenue created by the passage of a $2.5 million general override to sustain us in future years. That original plan charted a reasonable growth course for revenues and expenditures, allowing us to maintain and invest in city and school services by building up a new fiscal sustainability stabilization fund in FY 2014, 2015, and 2016, and then drawing from that fund in FY 2017 to balance our budget. I made it clear that this plan could give us four years before we would once again be facing a budget shortfall in FY 2018, necessitating cuts in services and personnel or the prospect of another override. I also promised the City Council and taxpayers that we would revisit the plan each year to measure our progress and would work hard every day in between to stretch revenues further in order to forestall the prospect of another override. One of the most significant and exciting features of the FY 2015 budget I am submitting today is that it will allow us to extend Northampton's fiscal stability plan by an additional two years to FY 2020. I'm going to say that again. It will allow us to extend Northampton's fiscal stability plan by an additional two years to FY 2020. We have been able to achieve this by lowering our expenditures in both the current and out years, revising revenue estimates based on updated historical data, and investing additional revenues in the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund to create a longer, more sustained glide path. My updated General Fund Fiscal Stability Plan that is attached to this budget message now calls for budgeting a larger portion of our revenues in the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund in FY 2015, 2016, and 2017, and drawing them down over FY 2018 and 2019 to maintain city and school services and balance our budgets. Once again, full disclosure, in FY 2020, we will deplete the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund and will face a budget shortfall. There are two positive aspects to this updated scenario, however. We will be facing a smaller budget gap in FY 2020 than projected in the original plan, and by then we will have paid off three of the city's four debt exclusion override capital projects that are currently part of our tax rate. While I, am, while I am pleased at the financial gains that this FY 2015 budget represents, please know that I will continue working every day to further prolong this period of fiscal stability and positive forward progress for our community. In closing, I want to thank our city department heads for working with me to develop their individual budgets that comprise the many parts of this overall budget. I want to thank Finance Director Susan Wright for her tireless work on this budget and for her help every day managing our city's finances so prudently and expertly. Thank you as well to my Chief of Staff, Lynn Simmons, who began compiling and editing the budget prior to her maternity leave and has continued assisting with its formatting and assembly in the final weeks leading up to its submission. I also want to say a special word of thanks to a recently retired member of my staff, Corrine Philippides. Corrine played a role in the creation of over 20 city budgets during her dis distinguished tenure in the mayor's office, and we acknowledge her role in this one and take this opportunity to thank her again for her service to Northampton. I look forward to working with the city council over the next several weeks to answer any questions about this budget or provide additional information it may need. Copies of budget documents are available for residents to review at our two libraries and at City Hall as well as electronically on the City of Northampton website at www.northamptonma.gov. Respectfully submitted, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, a few things. Uh, there will be, this is actually going to come up in finance, of course, and, uh, and, uh, and we were also, uh, at some point, scheduled hearings um, for counselors, if counselors ahead of time can think of what departments they want to review and consider and have come speak before us and present and just submit that to either Pam or myself and we'll try and s schedule those meetings so we'll have a sense of, usually it's about two to three special meetings and those are open to the public 
And the public, if they have any questions or concerns about the budget, please forward them to us, and we'll try and represent those in the in the um, in those hearings. Um, Your Honor, I don't know if you want to speak more on this now, or you prefer to wait till finance. I know that you have some proclamations, and uh, there's other items. So there are people who are sitting here, and I'll bet you 50 cents not one of them is here to hear the budget. But um, <laughs> I don't know how you would like to proceed. Just, I mean, the budget is laid out in the same format that we've done in the past. We continue to try to tweak it. Um, you know, we've tabbed it, and again, this is all, it's actually available right now on the city's website, so people can go to it and get it in a PDF format. Again, we've got it broken down in revenue expenditures, all the general fund budgets, we've got the enterprise funds, uh, those indirect charge uh, summaries that I talked about are in there um, for folks who want to understand those. We've got the two school budgets. Um, and then all the other um, debt schedules. And then we've got the capital budget orders, the capital plan, the capital budget orders, and we've got all the operating orders that you will eventually vote on as part of approving this budget. So it's all in there. The budget message is in there. Um, and we've got uh, lots of uh, charts and, uh, and historical data for people to look at as well so they can see how this budget compares to last, uh, to last year and to previous year's budgets. Um, and again, I'm ready to your hearings or answer questions that people have. Well, uh, two, two of the highlights in your budget message are, are significant to note, at least two, but the biggest being your, your projection all the way to 2020 um, with, the, with the confidence that you believe that we can present, uh, all, if everything, barring any catastrophe, that we can, we, uh, can run business as usual. In the, City well, again, it's a projection, and uh, we have to keep updating it. But we believe that uh, that this is good news, and the fact that we can now extend that plan an additional two years. So that large piece of cardboard I was carrying around for months uh, paid off. Still hangs in my office. <laughs> uh, we're now revising that, and uh, and we're gonna try. And we and we use that other one every day as a guide, and we'll continue to use this as a guide uh, in all the decisions we make. Can you that projection? Can you reconcile that with? The other trend, the other important point that you made was the diminishing obligations or commitments from the state, state and the federal government, of course, continue with mandates requiring us to do certain things, particularly relative to education, do not fund them, and that their obligation has been reduced almost by half um, from the traditional amount that we were used to receiving. If that trend <laughs> continues, how does that figure into your calculus? Well, that's uh, well. We've adjusted our. Uh, I think I said in the message that we were, you know, that the state aid exceeded our dismal projections for it. I think we had projected like 0.73 percent. That was our, and it came in at 0.23 percent. So you know, we're pretty much. I think at this point, reaching the point where um, the state aid is almost becoming. You know, it was 19.8 percent last year. Now it's 19 percent. Uh, you know, again, I think we're going to continue to work with our uh, partners in other cities and towns to really press the message that we, you know, if you want to talk in Boston about lowering people's property taxes around the state, there's a really easy way to do it, which is to give us back more of our uh, uh, income tax dollars and other tax dollars, uh, which will take some of this pressure off of local cities and towns who are now as I said, the message more reliant on the property tax than they've ever been in 30 years. So, um, so that's going to be a continued issue that we're going to have to work on. Um, and then also, you know, looking for other local revenue sources as well, which we continue to try to explore. Um, but this gives us more time to continue working on that. Again, we'll have a new governor, uh, and so, um, so you know, those, those are some of the factors. Um, any other councilors want? To uh, Council the Barge. Yes. Um, Mayor, I'd like to thank you, and especially to Susan Ray, Lynn Simmons, and especially Corrine. I mean, every year this budget book gets better and better, and there's you work tirelessly on showing the taxpayers in the city of Northampton and all of us councilors of where and how the money is being spent. And I want to thank you very much for such a great job that is done on this budget book. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Spector. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether we were going to wait until after finance well, or. I, I, 
if you have comments, I think a more me grittier question. Grittier questions. Wait, 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 wait till after finance so that finance we can get yeah. Anyone have any amorphous, less gritty, more touchy feely kind of things to say? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. We're really falling down on our touchy feely here, and I think we've got to pick it up here as the council <laughs> goes. If we've, we've got a reputation to uphold. Uh, Your Honor, then um, you still have the floor and some other documents to present. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I do have uh, some additional communications. I have a proclamation, which uh, I'm going to read, and then we'll have um, uh, some other comments. This is a proclamation uh, entitled National Public Works Week, May 18th through the 24th, 2014. Whereas public works services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs such as water, sewer, streets, stormwater, parks, and solid waste, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction, is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials, and whereas the year 2014 marks the 54th annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association, now, therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 18th through the 24th to be National Public Works Week in the city of Northampton. I call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved <laughs> in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the seal of the city of Northampton this 15th day of May in the year 2014, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor. And we have with us the city uh, well, we have a lot of yeah, we, have, we have a good chunk of the DPW. We have the city here. engineer, uh, Mr. Lorilla. I also want to recognize Dave Valletta, who's also our, our, our senior engineer. And then we have this guy who I've never seen in a suit before. <laughs> it shocked me, too. Uh, Rich Parcelletti, uh, who's our street superintendent. <laughs> He's looking very dapper, Mr. Parsley. Um, and so I want to formally present this uh, to you on, on behalf of the city to the Department of Public Works. Um, and also have you note that we are displaying this evening uh, the uh, annual National Public Works Week poster, which uh, is in City Hall and at the DPW, which we brought tonight. So I'll turn the floor over to got a nice bench uh, out Mr. Laurel. Thank you, Mayor. What a lovely poster. <laughs> what nice this year. Um, thank you. I'm Jim Laurel of the City Engineer, as uh, most, of you, most of you are aware. I just wanted to say a couple of words uh, this evening. Um, thank you so much for the proclamation. Uh, May 18th through 24th is, in fact, the celebration of Na National Public Works Week um, and the men, the men and women who provide and maintain the essential public infrastructure for the City of Northampton. So, um, as the Mayor had mentioned, um, roads, sidewalks, solid waste, parks and recreational fields, cemeteries, drinking water, Wastewater management, stormwater, and flood control systems are all um, parts of things that we take care of for the city every day. Um, this award uh, has been, um, a proclamation has been something that's been, it's the 54th year, as the mayor had mentioned, since 1960. Um, it's been an important part of um, educating the public about public works, things that, that uh, public works departments do every, uh, every day for communities. Um, I know that the City Council is quite familiar with Public Works. We get routine messages from, from the councilors, whether it's a detailed list from Mary Ann Labarge about the potholes in her award, which we appreciate the, uh, the skill and detail in those, those uh, emails to us, or Councilor Murphy thanking me for the high quality drinking water he was enjoying earlier this week. <laughs> appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I wanted to say today a little bit is, is to just drill down a little bit about, it's all about me today. Ned asked me to come tonight, so. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I love my job, and I think it's reflective of public works in the city as a whole. Um, as the city engineer, you would probably expect that I would say that I love my job because of the variety of technical challenges and the different things we get to work on, which is true. But I think the reason I like my job the most is the inspiration that I receive daily from the people that work with the department. Um, I look at the pride and the care that all the employees have and the work that they do. 
And that's really inspirational for me in the work that I do and in, in, in able to, uh, to take a look at that dedication. And I think people should be aware of how hard people work uh, on behalf of the city day in and day out and the difficult things that we do to take care of public infrastructure. And I think that's really what the week is about, is, is taking time to acknowledge the hard work of, of city staff that take care of this infrastructure for us. Um, I just, I don't, I guess I can say this. I wasn't drinking, but I just left a party at JJ's Tavern <laughs> for a, a retirement party for John Carver, who some of you may know is the chief wastewater treatment plant operator. John's been an employee for 36 years for the city. Um, and I think a lot of the skill and pride and hard work that uh, people in public works have are really embodied in people like John. To the day of his retirement, uh, he's still working as hard and as, uh, has as much pride and caring as ever in the work that he's doing. And um, I think he's a really good example of, of the types of employees that we have in the department. And the mayor, as usual, beat me to the punch. I was going to acknowledge the skill and dedication of David Valletta. He's already been acknowledged in, in Rich Parcelletti. And I do appreciate them following me this evening to provide the support I need to get up here and speak publicly. <laughs> Thank you for the proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, you know, I've said it over and over again. The guys who show up in the orange lights and the orange shirts don't get anywhere near the respect and regard that, say, people in blue shirts or blue lights or the firefighters show when they show up. Yet the, I would say 90% of the calls that we take are more related to DPW type of issues than any other thing. And it's, it is, in, as we talk about the diminishing attention nationwide of, of and deferred maintenance on, on infrastructure, um, you guys constantly struggle to do more with less. And, uh, you know, I think Council Marge's uh, pothole summary was, uh, was a perfect reflection of that manifestation of the, the, the federal and state. Again, Chapter 90 funds have also been reduced along with chapter, uh, along with school funding as well. So, we, you know, <laughs> you have my undying admiration. I think you guys have performed your job with, with uh, grace and courtesy and efficiency and effectiveness and um, you know, I'm glad that we have a put aside this little brief period to acknowledge that but I, I hope you know going forward that that lasts year round so I thank you very much for your work. Well I appreciate that. I'm glad I walked into the touchy-feely session. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out well. <laughs> okay hugs. <laughs> thank you. Your Honor, you have any more proclamations or no such things? Okay. Uh, <coughs> next up, we have. Yeah, wait a minute. Let's go to the paper version. Um, I believe we're at the one-minute announcements. I give. Uh, but it, do, do, oh no, I'm sorry. We have the uh, resolution. Uh, the announcement of the. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. We have the announcement of the 2014, <coughs> excuse me, uh, living wage uh, adjustment. Uh, I know Natalia's, it, it says Natalia Munoz here, but I see Kitty Callahan. So do you want to, Kitty, do you want to come and speak to that? Sure, I do. I figure you're, you're as qualified as anybody. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that Natalia did not think that she would be speaking here tonight. Right, she just put her name next to it and let you do it. So. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, in 2014, the living wage rate will go from $12.78 an hour to um, $12.97 an hour, representing a very sm a small increase in the consumer price, price index of 1.5%. Um, however, looking at... Um, the data from the consumer price index that uh, there was an increase in some some basic needs this year 2.9 percent for rent 3.2 percent for electricity and 2.5 percent in, in medical care services so it's important that every year that we're we're raising um, the living wage so that low-wage workers do not have to um, you know ha be the brunt of the impact of these increases so we're grateful that that the city council is is, is doing its job in, in announcing announcing every year the, um, the the increase in in the in the in the living wage rate. 
Um, we are also this year, we're supporting the um, ballot question and the legislation to raise the minimum wage. And that also um, raised up Massachusetts, which wrote the, the legislation, um, put in there an increase, an, an automatic increase after it reaches the top tier in January of 2016. Every year it's going to go up based on changes in the consumer price index. And um, we decide to support this because we have to take the politics out of changing the minimum wage. We haven't had a minimum wage change um, for five years. So people are making $8 an hour and not making ends meet. Um, and one of the things that we did instead of celebrating Living Wage Week, we had a minimum wage forum um, and brought together um, Peter Cocut and some legislative aides to, to bring support in the, leg in the House for, for the bill. And, and we were very happy to hear that everybody was in support of the, um, the proposal by Raise Up Massachusetts. I, I also want to very briefly announce that um, this, in the next month, we are going to be expanding our campaign um, to other communities in, Ma in Western Mass. And we have, we have developed a, a living wage based on, spring, on the cost of living in Springfield, which, we're going, which is lower, of course, than Northampton because the costs of housing are lower. And that rate is going to be $11.98 an hour. Um, Amherst we're going to give special <laughs> attention to because those housing rates are much higher. Than, North, than Northampton, and so we have to cal calculate a, a different um, living wage rate for, for Amherst. Um, but Northampton will no longer be the only community in Western Mass with a living wage campaign, and um, you know we're excited about launching this this new effort. That's I I, I appreciate you pointing that out. That. I mean, I, we, we were alone in the woods for quite a while there as Northampton. The reason that Kitty presents this annually is that actually Northampton Council voted, and I would like to pick the date, and I can't even remember. I think it was my first round as a counselor. To, um, 1998. 98. Yes. Oh my God. It's been my, yeah, okay. It was a long time ago. In 1998, established and have a declaration of what it would, t what it would cost someone to uh, continue to sustain themselves with life and dignity here in the community, and the and the, it was a an expression of commitment by the council then, and it's it, it I believe it stands, and I and I'm very grateful that you've taken the time today to come and, and explain that to us, and I'm glad that Amherst has decided to join us as has Springfield. Well, they haven't decided yet. I'm <laughs> we're, glad we're that launching. Amherst we're is considering it then, <laughs> and. If they want to play catch up, we'll we be yeah. glad to wall. We're actually not going to do the resolution route because it would t it would be very difficult to to cover each have a resolution in each town and community and right. city in Western Mass. We're going to launch our campaign, have have people come to our website, target different employers, and through word of mouth get the word out to different communities that you know that this is there for you so that your workers can, can earn a living wage. Well, thank you again for your efforts in that respect. And, then, and I enjoy our, our, our singular status then. <laughs> yes. You will be the first, <laughs> always. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Um, I'd just like to say um, also thank you. You're welcome. And when you look at a figure of 1297. Yes. And, and you realize that's, an, that's the amount that a single person without children needs. Right. right. To meet basic necessities like energy and housing and clothing. Yep. Right. And so it just, I know it puts a, a finer point on, on the shame we should feel of how hard it is to raise the minimum wage to $10. And so it just yep. makes the work you do all the more important. Right. Yeah. And it's a bare, it's a bare bones budget. Right. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you. Um, next up, and we have the, the resolution opposing the Northeast expansion of the Tennessee gas pipeline in Massachusetts, which is showing up uh, at this point. And I would invite um, uh, Councilor O'Donnell to introduce. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Should I read it or just provide it? Yeah, would you please? Yeah, that would. Sure, of course. 
Um, this is a resolution opposing the Northeast expansion of the Tennessee Gas Pipeline in Massachusetts. And it reads, whereas the so-called Northeast expansion of the Tennessee Gas Pipeline is a high-pressure natural gas pipeline, thereafter simply the pipeline, proposed by Tennessee Gas Pipeline Company, a, sus a subsidiary of Kinder Morgan, Inc., that would run through many communities in western Massachusetts, and whereas the city of Northampton has a regional interest in protecting the environment in the Pioneer Valley and in the United States and the public health generally, and whereas the pipeline would transport natural gas obtained through hydraulic fracturing, a drilling method well known for its potential for groundwater contamination, impact on air quality, and the harmful health effects of its chemical byproducts, among others, and whereas pipelines of this kind carry inherent risks, such as leaks and ruptures, and as conveyors of flammable gas can cause accidents, such as the 2010 explosion in a residential neighborhood in San Bruno, California, that resulted in the death of eight people and the destruction of 38 homes. And whereas the pipeline may pass through environmentally sensitive areas in our region, such as forests and wetlands, as well as beneath the Connecticut River, and whereas taxpayer money would pay for evacuations and emergency response in the event of explosions, fires, or other accidents, and whereas our energy challenges are better addressed through investments in green and renewable energy solutions. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts, first stands in opposition to the Northeast expansion of the Tennessee Gas Pipeline and all similar projects that may be later proposed, Second, stands in solidarity with nearby communities working to disallow the pipeline within their borders. Third, affirms the need for public policy at the local, state, and federal levels to encourage renewable energy and combat climate change, and supports legislation to ban or impose a long-term moratorium on hydraulic fracturing as well as the storage, treatment, or disposal of hydraulic fracturing fluids or byproducts within the Commonwealth. And finally, shall cause a copy of this resolution to be presented to the City of Northampton's legislative representatives and the Governor, asking them to take action to prevent the construction of the pipeline within the borders of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'll accept a motion. Second. Well, oh, I have, uh, 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 so moved. Motion? So moved. There you Sorry. Go. <laughs> and and Councilor Carney second. Um, do you want to speak more to this? I think it, it lays it out pretty pretty clearly. Uh, I think the value here is um, this is a, a regional issue, and even though a resolution doesn't have the force of law, um, we're really faced with a political challenge in terms of dealing with this issue that will ultimately affect everyone in the Pioneer Valley. And so that will be the value of joining. Um, at this point, I, I count 11 other towns in, in the region that have passed similar resolutions. Um, in opposing this, um, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because in this case, it's the only thing to do, I think, at this stage. Councilor Specter. Yeah. Council I want to thank my colleague for bringing this forward, especially at this time. Um, I think also the proclamation covers just about all the areas. I just want to speak to one of them. <clears throat> that, and this was brought up by Chris Mason in our last uh, Energy Commission meeting. This is a pipeline with bringing gas that we don't need and that we won't use and that will actually could undermine the attempts in this region, which have been pretty successful, to lower our carbon footprint through renewables and through things like the stretch code, which, which uh, we supported in terms of energy efficiency. You know, it's interesting that it's, it's kind of like jokes come to mind, but this isn't that funny, like what the frack were they thinking and are their heads in the tar sands? But really, in the last six weeks, we've had four different reports come out about climate change. On a national level, it's so discouraging because nothing has been done. I think the first bill on climate change was 18 years ago, and it actually had more support from Republicans than it would today. There was really a, a coalition of both parties, and it's extraordinarily disappointing, uh, to say the least, that nothing's going to be done at a federal level. And in fact, what's going to have to happen, and most people are saying this, it's going to have to happen at the very local level. It's not going to happen at a national level. 
any time in the foreseeable future. We've seen a UN report that basically talks about the future and what's going to happen. That came out about six weeks ago that I think shook most of us when we read that. Then the U.S. Science Panel came out with a report, I think it was about three weeks ago, the White House report, saying this isn't in the future anymore, guys. This is happening now. Then we had a report, I think it was just two or three days ago, by the U.S. military. This is not a, you know, progressive group, the U.S. military, but they're a hard-nosed group that looked at this and say, climate change is affecting how we should look at the world now and that it's going to be a very dramatic change that the military better take into account because of all the displacement. And then just today, I saw a report by another non-progressive group, the Insurance Institute. The Insurance Institute saying, because these folks are gamblers, basically. They're gamblers who control the house and the odds. And they're saying climate change is real to them, and the cost for crop insurance and flood insurance is going to grow up so dramatically mm -hmm. for them to be able to offer that that they may not offer those anymore. So all these things are happening. Meanwhile, Rome burns while uh, all the Neros in Washington play the fiddle. And so there's not a lot we can do, but anything we can do, we should do. You might have seen in the paper today that this town, that Northampton, is the first of the five-star communities, which is really about energy efficiency and renewables. And in this region, especially in Massachusetts, if the rest of the country ha had done what Massachusetts had done, there'd be a dramatic decrease in our carbon output. So this region has been a leader, not just in Massachusetts, but in New England as a whole. What Chris Mason pointed out was that in the study by Kinder Morgan itself on this pipeline, so the way they sell the pipeline is two ways. One, they sell it by talking about natural gas, which for years, and I bought into this too, natural gas, it's cleaner than, a lot cleaner than coal, it's better than oil. Well, fracked gas is not. So that was one thing, that was one way they sell it, but still you could say, well, it's still natural gas. I kind of like natural gas. The second reason they talk about it being important is it's going to provide important new energy source for this region. And in their own study, it says that if this region continues on its path of conservation of renewables, we don't need this gas. That's their study. So this is gas we don't need, done with a process we don't approve of. And so I really support this. And one of the few ways we're going to do this, and we do have an election coming up, governors and other people, the folks who are going to decide on this aren't going to be local communities. It's going to be our legislature. And I think this is one of those cases where these 11 communities, and we'll be the 12th and there'll be others, are sending a strong message. And we need to do that, saying, hey, if you guys support this, we won't be supporting you come November. Council Labarge. I'm going to support this resolution 100%. And even though it's not going to affect our city of Northampton, we have many other cities or communities that have had resolutions and opposing the Tennessee gas pipeline coming through. I find it that it really opposes a great danger no matter where it's going to be placed. And we also need to look at people's private property. That's another big issue of how much land would actually be taken by this company to private owners. I also feel the environment, which I really support protecting our environment, and the fracking, the procedures on it, I've been checking this out and I have great concerns of the damage that it can do for people's health, for um, anything, the water, protecting our water, I think this is the right way to go. Um, I should note that the Energy Commission voted unanimously to support this resolution. Also, the, uh, the reason this comes about is the New England governors have combined to try and figure out the best way to do carbon offsets and to uh, reduce our, our carbon generation. And this was being offered as one of the alternatives. The, the, uh, Fracked gas. Would, an excellent article. The paper. argument goes that would reduce our dependency on coal production, coal fire plants, which are clearly uh, have been clearly indicted for uh, their contribution to the carbon input into the atmosphere. Um, and as Councilor Spector pointed out, in fact, that's a zero-sum game 
on uh, even by even by the proponents own study so in fact actually we're going to benefit much more by doing what we are doing the the fact that we are we won uh, you didn't brag on this enough and uh, Northampton is actually in a nationwide standard called the star rating similar to the way you get star ratings for your refrigerator they decided to apply that to communities of every community in every town so far in this country only one has received five stars only one city in the entire country the first you're sitting in it this is Northampton and we we <laughs> and we get to brag on that we will always be the first we will be the baseline we are the standard by which all the other communities San Francisco Chicago New York City Cal any other, any other community in the state are going to be measured by it only makes sense that if we if we stand in opposition of this pipeline for a variety of reasons and point of fact it does affect us because as, as uh, Council O'Donnell points out in the, in the language of this this is a regional issue we will be we will incur no benefits but all the liabilities um, you know you don't have to go you don't have to go too far back to look at the the impact of the BP oil uh, spill and oil explosion the Derrick and the effect that it had on the surrounding communities and, and the people are paying for that. BP is paying for it to some degree, but for the most part, it's paid for daily with the people whose lives and livelihoods have been destroyed and the environmental impact. So if the New England governors decide, and they still haven't decided whether they want to go with fracking gas, with <coughs> fracking gas if they continue to proceed with it, truth be told, they get to trump resolutions. They get to trump everything that all these communities have voted on to say, no, you can't come here. We can say it. The only way that you can stop it is by expressing, I think, up front, loudly, clearly, succinctly, the, the opposition and the reason for the opposition for this. And I, and I think this is very timely. I think it's appropriate at this point. And it's, it's why, uh, when invited, I uh, was proud to co-sponsor this. So, um, any other discussion? Uh, would you like a roll call vote on this? Yes. Or would you like a, a roll call vote, please? Councillor Carney. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. I will abstain. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. <coughs> the resolution passes. Uh, next up, I uh, have an announcement of a public hearing, and that's uh, scheduled for Thursday, June 5th, 2014, <coughs> at 7.05 p.m., and that will be regarding the mayor's budget, the 2015 budget, and that will convene here in, uh, in council chambers. Um, one minute announcement. It's the one thing I keep forgetting every time. Uh, yes, Councilor Shara. Um, for Ward Four people, I'm uh, having a coffee on ne a week from tonight, so next Thursday at 7:30 at the Haymarket Cafe. Uh, everyone's welcome, but particularly Ward Four folks, if you want to come and um, meet up and talk, please do. So 7:30 Haymarket. Any other one minute announcements, Councilor Klein? Tuesday, May 20th at 6 o'clock in Leeds, um, across from Leeds Village Apartment Building. Uh, the Leeds Civic Association and I will be sponsoring um, a community meeting on how to keep our green spaces clean. And uh, there, there will be refreshments. And all residents of Ward 7, <clears throat> all residents of the city are welcome, but um, certainly the residents of Leeds. Anyone else? Any other announcements? Thank you. And my apologies for passing that up, I think, the last three meetings that I <coughs> presided over. So, um, Next up, we have licenses and petitions. And we have a lot of them. And we have, we have two applicants, I see. Uh, so uh, how, how does the council want to proceed with these? May I ask a, just a question on these? Were all of them given, uh, all of them been cleared by uh, 
the appropriate the, channels or any should any be separated out from the group for any variety of reasons the I uh, the ones I read I didn't see anything the, the city clerk has said I believe that so. everyone's up to speed on their taxes yes and yeah, actually, this we got. We have, we have an insider in the clerk. Office. Yes. Do you want to speak to these, uh, <laughs> Give us the inside things? scoop here. As a matter of protocol, we don't uh, present to you anything that has an issue. So everyone has been cleared through a permit denial um, form from the tax collector um, that the taxes are current. Um, and regarding, if you want to discuss the taxis and whatnot. Um, all of the appropriate paperwork is in place, including um, so, so insurance. Um, uh, they, they, they need to have child uh, seat. Right, all uh, of the various. And, and that sort of thing. So all of that stuff has been put into place. So I would recommend taking them as, as a group and discussing them as a group. I, I would ask that you remove one item from the group and sure. that's uh, feeding two records because I'll have to abstain. Oh, sorry, from, from what? Uh, I have to abstain on one of these uh, for feeding tube records. Okay, so I would uh, say we take them all as a group, except for that one and any other that the council right. specific. So the motion is all as a group with that one exception of feeding tube records. Is there a second? Second, second it. Okay, and Council Labarge, you have some comments? I, I was just going to say that to take the one that you wanted out, which would leave us 14 that we're going to be approving out of the 15. And I'm, I'm going to read them. A question I'm good, sure just about the process and so <clears throat> excuse me these all just come up at this at this time because it's an expiration uh, is there is, is that the reason is there a date Usually that? April um, in April their licenses become um, mm -hmm. have to be renewed. okay so that would mean and pretty much that this is the the universe of second-hand dealers that in the city we see before us right and, and trucks and taxis and yeah the weekday right. bowling for this for this list yeah, I believe that um, useless breakables um, in Rose River and Rain are probably the only two that are new on this list that you haven't seen before. Right. All of the others are, are in the list. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to read for the record um, the, the applicants for the last of this. Um. The uh, license for secondhand dealers is Antiques Corner at 5 Market Street, Northampton. Uh, Back Alley Antiques and Collectibles at 238 Bridge Street. Uh, Stuart F. Solomon Antiques at uh, 9 and 3 quarters Market Street. Kid Stuff, 90 Maple Street. Edward T. Hardy at 9 Corticelli Street. Urban Exchange at 233 Main Street. Jack Spire at 416 North Main Street in Leeds. The Family Jewels at 56 Green Street. Feeding Tube Records at 90 King Street. Norman E. Menard on 25 Garfield Avenue. Rose River and Rain LLC at 22 Maplewood Shops. Useless Breakables at 376 Pleasant Street. NoHo House of Vintage at 11 Bridge Street, Unit C. Cancer Connection, 375 South Street. The Instrument Exchange at 13 King Street. And then licenses for junk dealers, that'd be Norman E. Menard at <clears throat> 25 Garfield Avenue. Richard and Sharon Huntley at 254 East Hampton Road. Uh, licenses for truck and taxi, Bill Willard Incorporated at 1010 Ryan Road in Florence. Cosmic Cab, 78 Con Street, number four rear. And that's five taxis, by the way, I should say, yes, uh, five trucks for Willards, five taxis for Cosmic Cab. Aaron's Paradise Transportation on 14 East Hampton Road, Northampton, that's nine taxis. Go Green Cab Company, 2 Con Street, number 34, Northampton, that's three taxis. Funky Cab at 123 Holly Street, Northampton, with two taxis. <clears throat> and then weekday and Sunday bowling licenses, which... Uh, is an artifact back when bowling was considered a sin. Uh, Northampton Bowl, 525 on Pleasant Street, and then weekday and Sunday license for pool tables, an even greater sin, uh, at Packard's at 14 Masonic Street. Um, so with the exception of, um, of feeding tube records, 
The motion's been put on the floor. Is there any discussion on those items? None. Uh, this, is, this can be done by voice vote. So um, all those in favor of approving these licenses, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Now for feeding tube records, I'll accept a motion, put that on the floor. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on feeding tube records? Uh, once again, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I abstain. Okay, so that, by the way, we just blew through the really daunting looking portion of the, uh, the agenda. Oh, Priscilla's here. Where's, where's that? Fireworks? Fireworks, fireworks yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're up to fireworks. Priscilla, I'm sorry. I wasn't on this, it's not on my agenda here. I saw Priscilla sitting there. I, I had a feeling she didn't come here just for the fun. Mm. I don't know. My apologies. It's not on my agenda, but it is on the reg everyone else's agenda. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's, it's what? I couldn't read it from back there. Anyway. Yeah, I didn't know what okay. <laughs> um, so um, actually, do you, so this is for um, the fireworks display permit for the uh, family fourth committee. Um, and here is the application. So you want to just explain what we already know, what you're about to explain. But please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, this is the fourth year for the Northampton family fourth celebration. This year will be on June 28th. It's a celebration um, of our independence. It's at Look Park. Um, we have music. We have food from local vendors. We have carnival games that uh, the PTOs benefit from. The JFK band and chorus benefit from the parking. Um, and uh, then we end the night with an incredible display of fireworks by Atlas Pyrotechnics. So the city council has supported this in the past. Thank you very much. We couldn't do it without the support of the city. So, Council Thank you. Um, so it's the same procedure that we're doing where the fire department will be on site for the arrival and through the display, correct? And for the first light sweep the next day. <laughs> Councilor Adams. Was the Gazette editorial helpful to your fundraising efforts? Yes. Good to know. Yes. Thank you very much to the Gazette. They really jumped on it, and um, a lot of new businesses, new donors have stepped up, so we're doing very well. Well, it is an excellent event, goes without saying, so, and we're very grateful for that, for sure. Any other questions? Um, well, just a, yes. well, just it's important to note, I think, um, for folks who might be concerned <coughs> about this, as I was, at the time, but all of the, at least the resident animals that are at the park are removed during the fireworks display in order to prevent those that would be more traumatized by the fireworks than removed. Right. Okay. Council Murphy. So what I would move we grant the permit. There's a motion made to grant the permit. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Thank you very much, Priscilla. Thank you very much. Forward to it. Okay, so sorry about that oversight. Um, <laughs> sorry. Pam, Pam points out to me that I have the old agenda. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, so we'll go to this paper stuff. Um, this uh, and now we're, uh, for the we're up. I'm sorry. Yes. We're at the reports of committees and, and approval of minutes. I'll move approval of the minutes of April 27th and May 1st. Second it. Any discussion on the minutes, Councilor O'Donnell? Uh, minor correction. April 17th. Um, on the 17th, the number of, of us present. It says, well, it's, um, the very top says eight counselors, and then under the roll call, it just says nine parentheses eight. So maybe it was eight and a half or something. I wasn't there. So I, th I would be the absent oh, counselor. So six counselors. Right. <laughs> it's just a Scribner's error. Yes, you that counted that's yeah. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> my, my shadow counted as some form of vote. So. <laughs> with with uh, that Scribner's error adjusted, uh, are there any other comments on the uh, on the <clears throat> All those in favor of approving the two minutes, please aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Um, we also have uh, the committee reports for uh, Ed Lou. Is no, sir, approved. Second. Okay. Any discussion on those? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And now we're up to uh, appointments. And this is a new appointment, appointment to the Council on Aging, uh, Margaret LaSalle, 11 Chestnut Street in Florence. The term uh, starting April 2014 to expire April 2017 it comes with a positive recommendation from ordinance. And then also uh, Lorraine Wyman, 300 Acre Brook Drive in Florence, a term uh, to start April 2014 and expire April 2017, also with a positive recommendation from ordinance. These two as a group? Motion is second. It. Second. Any discussion on the applicants? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. New appointment to the planning board. This is uh, Teresa Perone Poe. Term to start March 2014 to expire March 2019 to replace Jennifer Derringer, whose term expired March 2014. This comes with a positive recommendation from ordinance. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on the applicant? Mm, she looks real good. I just think she will be a great asset to the planning board. Mm -hmm. Here. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then a new appointment. This is the housing partnership, Peter Frothingham. Uh, the term to begin May 2012 and expire May 2015. That's <clears throat> filling the unexpired term of uh, Patty McGill. And this is to refer to ordinance. To refer. And second. Motion made to refer and seconded. All those in favor of referring to ordinance, please say aye. 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 Okay. And now we come to uh, recess for uh, finance. For a figuratively passing Councilor Murphy, and the mayor gets to, the mayor and Susan get to pop up again and and take us through the budget. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. And would you call the roll of finance? Councillor Murphy? Here. Councillor Adams? Here. Councillor Labarge? Present. Councillor Sharon? Here. So, uh, as Councillor Dwight indicated, the budget is the first thing on finance tonight, and we'll defer to the mayor at this point if he wants to add anything to his previous presentation. So, with the mayor not having anything additional to add at this point, it is our tradition to refer the budget from finance to the entire council for the slated budget hearings that are set up by the <coughs> council president. Uh, we, the budget's a very important thing to, to all the voters in Northampton and all the councilors who represent them. So um, I would ask uh, a motion out of finance to refer this to the council as a whole for further scrutiny. I make a motion to refer it to our full city council. Second? Second. Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And so the council president will set up our traditional budget examination. Uh, <coughs> any other yes. yeah. Oh, there, there are. There's one on uh, land taking and uh, yeah. a sewer <laughs> See, they're now hermetically sealed, so we don't. Right, it's, you know. So I don't write so on them. <laughs> <coughs> so you can eat jelly donuts and uh, still preside. Even if you got them. <laughs> so this is upon the recommendation of the mayor, David J. Narkowitz. Order that 330, 300, $332,370 be appropriated from the FY14 general fund undesignated fund balance to the following accounts, 75000 $535 to Snow and Ice uh, Personal Services Overtime, $121,488,000 Snow and Ice OM Vehicular Supplies, $125,347 Snow and Ice OM Snow Removal Supplies, and $10,000 to Flood Control Personal Services Overtime. Um, the Mayor, want to comment on this while we're... Uh, uh, no, this is just our, you know, um, winter's over, thank goodness. Uh, 
And so uh, this is our uh, transfer uh, from free cash into our snow and ice budget. You may recall that you um, invoked our deficit spending uh, c capabilities uh, early in the year. And so uh, this uh, now will, um, will fund all of those uh, snow and ice accounts that we were deficit spending on until April when we uh, see snow, op snow fighting operations. I can answer any questions about it or um, I also uh, I have a chart which I can give you if that's helpful. Um, it's a chart that just gives you kind of our historical snow and ice expenditures if that's uh, um, uh, just gives you a sense and you know essentially that chart uh, is about as predictable as the weather uh, in terms of what we're going to spend each year. Um, you can you can see our 2014 number uh, 748 720 um, and uh, and then you can see the fluctuations you know back 2011 obviously was uh, F, uh, was you know, an even worse winter um, uh, and uh, that being the winter of the uh, Halloween snowstorm and uh, and then the uh, ensuing winter that followed after that so um, so that just gives you kind of a history of what our what our spending has been for snow and ice and uh, this order will allow us to uh, to uh, true up those accounts and take them out of deficit mm -hmm. Councilor Baj yes um, mayor at one point I remember we had the snow insurance will we ever be looking to go back to that? Uh, my sense of it is in uh, is that we had uh, we did have snow insurance uh, for a while and um, and I think a lot of cities had, uh, and I think it was a, a good deal for a while. We we were ahead of the game. Uh, for people at home, this was an insurance you could buy, um, and once you reached a certain uh, snow level, uh, you would uh, get paid by the insurance company. Um, as the, as after a few winters of a lot of payouts, um, they changed some of their metrics, and of course they raised um, the cost of the policy. Uh, so the cost benefit analysis that was done uh, by the DPW, and I think we've looked at it, I don't know if, uh, if Richard did you want to comment on that, is that we really haven't, uh, it hasn't been viable um, going forward. So that's the, that's the status on that. Any more questions in finance yeah. or from anyone? Do we have a motion for a positive recommendation? Yes. Second. I make a second. Second. Okay. All right. All in favor in finance? Aye. 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 And then the last one, um, two more. Two more. Two more. Uh, this one is for uh, for DPW and upon their recommendation. Whereas the Department of Public Works des desires to install a sewer line and related facilities from Industrial Drive to Bradford Street North, which will cross the land of David Short, and whereas David Short is willing to grant an easement to the city for the installation, maintenance, repair, and replacement of such sewer line. Now, therefore, it be ordered. The city Council authorizes the acquisition by gift, purchase, eminent domain, or otherwise of two permanent easements on and under a portion of the land of David Short, located off Industrial Drive, Northampton, Massachusetts, shown as proposed sewer easement A area of 22,290 square feet and proposed sewer easement B of 255 square feet on a plan entitled easement plan for the city of Northampton, Hampshire County, prepared for the city of Northampton on April 14, 2014, by Northeast Survey Consultants for the purpose of maintaining, repairing, and replacing sewer pipes, lines, and all facilities within the easement area, and to enter and remain upon the easement area by foot and with vehicles and equipment for the purpose of maintaining and repairing, replacing said sewer facilities, and to grade as necessary in order to maintain the stability of the easement area, and that no further appropriation is necessary for the acquisition of the easement authorized here under. And then uh, the remainder of the order is just the technical specifications of where the easement is and so forth. So uh, do we have a motion in finance? I have a motion to send it to full city council. Second. 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 All right. Um, anything else from the mayor on this one or anyone from DPW? Mr. Laurel is here and recognized. Do you uh, have anything to add on this one? Just briefly, I wanted to say that uh, Mr. Short has been quite accommodating in working with the Public Works Department uh, as we seek to build a new um, sewer main that would run from the industrial park to the Bradford Street pump station. It's an important project for us, and we appreciate his willingness to work with us on an easement. So, Jim, it's a new line being placed, and it's not a pre-existing, correct? That's correct. It's a, yep, that's right. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering when when you plan on doing that work. Um, yeah, work's under design right now, and if the easement and the, the public way issues move forward, um, it could be later this summer. Okay. Um, no other questions, and do we do we we don't need Mr. Laurela to remain for? Well, it's going to come up real quick again, but he's got he has one got more. Bradford to discuss. Yeah, he has one more. Yeah. yeah, which is this one, which is pretty much the same thing. So, in finance, if there are no more questions, all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And then this is the easement. And this is Mr. Short, I, David Short, 12 Billings Road, Montague, Massachusetts, for consideration of $1 paid, grant to the inhabitants of the City of Northampton and Municipal Corporation, authorized under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts <laughs> principal offices here at 210 Main Street, Northampton, Mass, uh, with quick claim, covenant, quick claim covenants. And um, it basically, if you would like me to read it, is the same as the taking. Uh, do you want me to read it, or are we good with the technical specifications of the sizes of the easements. No, that's fine. Um, so do we have a pro positive recommendation for this Second. finance to send it forward? Second. Second. Okay. Any more discussion on this one or any anything from Mr. Laurel? Are we good on this? Aye. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none? Very good. <laughs> I think that is it. Correct? So a motion to adjourn finance. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> All right. So we're, we're um, reconvened. <laughs> and uh, we have a financial order, the financial order that just uh, uh, this on first that's reading. Actually, actually, well, that's not council. We have to do a roll call on council. Right. The, uh, um, this is the appropriate uh, to appropriate three hundred thirty-two thousand uh, three hundred seventy dollars from the FY14 general fund, undesignated fund balance, uh, which is also free cash to snow and ISPS and OM, and flood control PS. And this Move is reading second motion made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion on this? Roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Sarah? Yes. Councillor Spector? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Uh, it's, it is passed in first reading, and the second reading will be scheduled at the next council meeting. Uh, next up is the order of taking for laying out public ways over Bradford Street South and Bradford Street Extension and Bradford Street North. Move to approve. Second. Uh, any discussion nope. about this? Hearing none, um, ready for the next one. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. That also passes, <coughs> passes in first reading, and the second reading will be at the next scheduled council meeting. Uh, this financial order is uh, order for acquisition of a sewer easement over the land of David H. Short, and this is also first reading. Move to approve. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Next up, this is second reading. Uh, it was it was approved in first reading at the last council meeting. Authorization of two hundred sixty-four thousand two hundred dollars for conservation commission to acquire fifty acres in the Sawmill Hills conservation area. Move to approve. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion on this? Any more information. Take it away. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. This financial order is also in second reading. This is to appropriate $117,200 from the FY 2014 general fund undesignated fund balance, aka free cash, to the Academy of Music Fire Escape Repair and Replacement Project. Second. 
Motion made and seconded. Um, Councilor O'Donnell and then Councilor Sierra. Any further discussion? Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Speck. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor uh, Murphy. Yes. It is approved in second reading. Financial order here, uh, appropriate uh, $10,950 from receipts reserved for appropriation parking to garage structural repair program uh, project. I'm sorry, and this is second reading. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion on this item? Okay, Pam. Councilor Shera. Yes. <laughs> second, sorry. Tack of the pen here. Councilor Spector. <laughs> yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. It's the, the hazards of. Uh, I know. <laughs> Someone's going to lose an eye. <laughs> um, I hope it's not us. Uh, the final item, also in second reading, is a financial order for our, the FY 2014 budgetary transfers of $197,318. Move to approve it. Motion to be made by Council of Arts and second by Council of We skip one? I think you yeah, missed one. We skip one. Just, just so you know. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll get back, back to it. it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. He was trying to see. That was the, yeah, mm. uh, the covered parking issue. I think one through one. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, any discussion on this, though, on the uh, the budgetary? Transfer? No. No discussion? Okay. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shera? Yes. And then the one I skipped, appropriation of $10,960 from receipts reserved for appropriation. Uh, this is the park, parking to cover parking enforcement and parking <coughs> maintenance salaries. Second. To approve it. Second. Any further discussion on this item? Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shera? Yes. Councillor Speck? Yep. That is approved in second reading as well. Now we move on to orders and ordinances. And this is the first order up is to change city council rules, rule three suspension of council rules with it comes with a positive recommendation by the committee on rules, orders and appointments and ordinances. And this is first reading and I would invite Councilor Adams to uh, expound on this. This is an old rule. And the only change is the new language in bold. And that change is because it's just clarifying that we've been doing something that's illegal for um, since the charter changed every time that we've um, voted on a referral without it first going to the committee that deals with uh, uh, recommendations for so um, that's the only change and um, and so um, I think you know this rule allows us to suspend our our other rules when we want to and if that we should have a more thorough discussion then we don't suspend them so to me it's uh, pretty straightforward Councilor Carney then Councilor right, um, just a clarification and you you did cl clarify this at um, the ordinance committee but it's a super majority and has been a super majority for um, suspending rules all along that's not a new thing tonight right thank you just to clarify anything first perception from comments by the way, I, I'd accept a motion for this on the floor. I'll make a motion to move it. Second. Uh, Councilor Specter, you have a comment? Yeah, just a comment because this came up in public comment that um, there, there's a reason why this rule is there and it helps the council do its business more efficiently and effectively. It's not because, you know, to make it more convenient for the councilors. I actually think there's been an effort on this council in the past council. Um, past session that whenever there's any question about a second reading unless there's some um, 
it's you know some very good reason to have a second reading. I think we've really tried to say let's let's put off a second reading. Let's try and use that rule as little as possible. But that said, I think there's a reason for it being there, which is it allows us. You know, people talk about how bulky government is and how slow it is, and this is small, but it's a way of just allowing us to do our business. For example, to not have to read, do a second reading of two pages of material, but to summarize it in a second reading. And any counselor here, and this has happened at times, can call for a full second reading. But I think these are just ways so that we can have a more efficient running of the council. Councilor Murphy? No, nope. I would just say I can never recall an occasion where a counselor objected to us doubling up when we didn't acquiesce and say, all right, you want yeah. to do it that way, we'll do it that way. Exactly. Yes, I want to echo what Councillor Spector talked about. I for not have a problem with this. I mean, for 17 years, we've suspended rules and so forth. And we've also had um, two readings, like from the mayor's office, when it came to um, something that was very serious on the budget, that they needed to get it approved on the two readings. I don't have a problem with this. Historically, part of the problem is that um grant applications, financing issues don't necessarily go on the council's more lugubrious calendar. And so they don't meet our clock and consequently there is a request for second readings to qualify in many cases for additional funding. Or there's a deadline that states certain that precedes our council meeting. And two alternatives, one we could actually call for a special council meeting in lieu of suspending rules. Um, but and and I think should something reach that critical point if there's dissent in the, within the council then it would make sense to do that but point in fact actually as Councilor Murphy pointed out there is uh, to my memory never been any resistance to anyone who calls for not suspending rules if, if, a, if a member objects uh, it's not written in the rules it's not codified by what it's being described but it has been the general of it and part of and this has been Councilor Adams scrutiny due to Councilor Adams scrutiny it's very important because the rules are the council rules are not the law necessarily but they are our rules and they're they're established not just for us but hopefully for future councils that will convene and refer to those rules we've modified them on occasion to adapt to uh, um, technology to adapt to efficiency and the like but um, they they don't have the same, I don't know, sanctity that, say, the, the charter does. So it is, as Councilor Specter pointed out, the purpose of the rules is to, uh, to promote transparency and effective governance. And, and I really do, and I, and I appreciate any comments to that effect, but uh, I think we're pretty assiduous when we, when we deal with that. And th once again, thanks to Adam, uh, Councilor Adams' uh, diligence on this point. So. Any other discussion? No. Nope. <clears throat> uh, roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Fine. Yes. Councilor Labard. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shira. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. And next up is, and that is passed in first reading, and it will be subject to second reading. <laughs> unless anyone wants to suspend rules on that, which I don't think they do, <laughs> that, uh, uh, it will be at the next council meeting. Um, this is to amend the Charter Rules and Finance Committee uh, and the, uh, to refer to number 11 in the order of business. And first I'll accept a motion. Oh, I've never referred to ordinance because it's never been there. Okay, there's a motion to refer to ordinance. Second. Second on that, and there's the second. Um, but Councilor Adams, would you like to speak? Yeah, this, uh, should, thank you. It should be on for referral. And this is just, there are just some suggestions about what we've talked about as far as if we want to um, streamline, fi streamline the finance committee meetings, which occur within the full council meetings. Um, so I've made a proposal, and I spoke with Solicitor Seawald today, and he told me that he'd like to um, further consider it with me. So if, if he, if, if he, make some suggestions and I incorporate them I'll, I'll bring that to the ordinance committee when they consider this if it happens before that point. Council Labar. Yes maybe council president you could explain why did it come on the agenda for a first reading? 
Um, I think it was just an oversight. We didn't, we didn't have it set up for a referral. But I think in, in my email where I sent it to the council clerk, I I think I state that I was for referral. So I think that's my oversight. It's we got it. Got it. <laughs> we got it. Any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that's been referred to ordinance, and we'll come back with a recommendation or okay. or not. Um, I keep referring to the agenda on my screen, which has failed me several times tonight, so I'm going <laughs> to, this is the, uh, this is to establish the uh, stormwater and flood control <coughs> utility fee, and this is the first reading, and I'm going to read, <coughs> read it, please. Uh, ordered that in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 58, the stormwater and flood control utility fee established by the Code of Ordinances, Section 280-5, shall constitute a municipal ch oh, shall constitute a un <laughs> well there shouldn't be a plural here or there shouldn't be uh, but constitute a municipal charge lien enforceable in accordance with the provisions of Section 58. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this? No, it's common sense. No? <laughs> it's okay. Um, uh, you want to explain? Your Honor? Um, speaking of your rules, I just wanted to be clear. I, this, uh, I don't know if this has been referred or if it's your understanding it doesn't need to be referred because you're, um, uh, I'm happy to speak to it. I mean, essentially, this is a follow on to your adoption of the stormwater yep. um, utility, and it's something we have in place for water and sewer. Um, it essentially says that if you don't nope. pay your bill, then we could put a municipal lien on it um, so that we have an, an ability to, to enforce the payment of that. So now, the motion is to approve. Is there a preference to, to move to suspend the referral rule? There's been a motion to uh, suspend the uh, Second. referral rule. Second. Any discussion on that? No. On, on the, on the referral rule. On the referral. All those in favor of suspending the rule for referral, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So now we stand back on the original motion and Council Murphy. Oh, I think the mayor was about to say something when we were voting. No, no, it's fine. Oh, he wasn't. Okay. So essentially, this this simply gives the force of Chapter 68 for the collection of the stormwater fee that we've talked about extensively so far this year, mm -hmm. and it needs to be in place for the beginning of fiscal 15 when we start building. For July 1st. So exactly. it's got to. Exactly. It's, it's, it's going to be on a short track one way or the other. We have. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If we refer it, we're going to have to do two readings on yeah, it exactly. properly to get it done. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a universality. It's creating a new universality of rules that apply mm -hmm. across the board on all the enterprise, all the enterprise funds. Yep. So it's not exclusive to one particular enterprise fund as it is now. Any other discussion on this item? No. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Fine. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Specter. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Uh, next up is to amend Chapter 350-7.4 signs permitted in any B district projecting blade signs and standard wall signs by right. <clears throat> this comes with a positive recommendation from ordinance. I'll accept a motion, put it on the floor. So Second it. Does anyone want to speak to this order? Councilor Murphy? You wouldn't know. It sounds provocative. <laughs> yeah. But all they are is signs that stick straight off the building. Exactly. And planning wants to loosen up their regulations a little bit and start to permit them for first floor businesses. And they think it's a good idea and it seemed to make sense. So. And well, just to um, confirm what the councilor said, uh, that right now, a, a business would have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals in order to get this, and what this just does is takes, it relaxes that a bit so that they're allowed by right. I think it's the right direction to go to, especially for our business people, so I think this is a very good ordinance. Is, is this in also response, does this help offset some of the challenges that arise from sandwich board signs? Uh, nothing to do with Because these are fixed to buildings. Yes, yeah, this is for buildings. Yeah, they're, fi they're fixed on buildings. Right, but what I'm saying is that 
businesses that were on side streets were not benefiting from people looking down the side street. They needed a, a wafer and sign the, in the form of a sandwich board. That's a different, yeah. a different sign rule. Right. No, I understand that. Well, I'm just hoping it that, may. that relieves some of the oh, issues of the need for a, a sandwich board. It may. <laughs> They didn't, really not. They, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't bring that up in discussion for, okay. as a motivation. For it could. They just did it on a whim. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Aldano? Yes. Councilor Shira? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Um, that's passed uh, in first reading. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be voting on that at the next scheduled council meeting. Uh, this is to amend Chapter 312-82, Crossing Roadways. This comes with a positive recommendation on the rules and orders and appointments. An ordinance, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second? Second. Would you like to speak to this? Uh, the chair of TMP probably oh, should. I'm happy to. This is... Um, Something that was recommended by the Department of Public Works. It's a technical change that just updates an old ordinance that describes how crosswalks should look. Simply says they need to comply with federal guidelines. This acronym, yeah, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the state amendments to it. So, and, and if there are any old crosswalks that aren't in compliance, the nature of this manual is that's okay um, because it's forward looking. So there's no concern about that. Uh, Technical. Is it possible that I'm just trying to, you know, in my desperation to try and make everything seem cohesive, is it possible this came up in the course of the discussion of the rainbow crosswalk? Is it? In terms of chronology, yes, it did. It came up directly afterwards. <laughs> However, it doesn't um, validate the crosswalk that is currently painted. That's the, the more salient point. It's the it meets the standard, the current uh, rainbow crosswalk conforms to the standards of Massachusetts uh, transportation. It, it does. So, so the federal government is sanctioning rainbow crosswalk. So essentially, rather than having our own ordinance description of a crosswalk, it just references the apostolic book of crosswalks right. as the authority for crosswalks. <laughs> and we don't describe them anymore, we just refer to the big book. <laughs> Yes. That's yeah. Any other comments on this? Any other discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. That's passed in first reading and will be revisited at the next scheduled council meeting. Um, could we take three of these as a group, the ones that refer to the extension of the moratorium? I'll second that motion. Uh, uh, well, I'm just asking if we can take those three as a group. To that point? I would like to slightly suggest an amendment to one of them. Okay. okay. Well, then could the other two be taken the as a group? The, the main extension ordinance I would like to. Okay, so then he wants to take the first one and then okay. the other two will take as a group. Although I, right, exactly. Well, I'll accept the motion for that then. To move the other two, is that your motion? Oh, when the, when we come up to those, yeah, then the one that he yeah, wants to separate the out. All right, so we'll, we'll anyway. proceed with the first one. Then. Okay. And this is to amend Chapter 350 to extend the moratorium uh, through December 31st, 2014. This is a recommendation from ordinance um, to extend the moratorium until December 31st, 2014. Um, the R O. AO public hearing continued until June 9th, 2014. Move to, move to approve. Second. Um, Councilor O'Donnell, yeah, I'd like to make a, I, I think this is a friendly amendment, it doesn't change it substantively. In fact, it could be, tell me if this is, this is just wrong. But the rationale section of it, mm -hmm. I know that doesn't, it's not part of the ordinance in terms of changing the code. But, I mean, the ordinance committee didn't write that rationale, and I just would prefer strike that paragraph for and it says something for example like therefore public hearings will likely be continued to September I mean I don't know that that's true or not so I'd rather just strike the rationale paragraph if that's a second a second I'm, so 
do you see where they I do. want to make that the, the whole paragraph? You want to delete that paragraph? I'd like to make it irrational if I could. <laughs> Council Murphy, to the, to just to speak to the how we got to that point, um, the last ordinance committee meeting had a joint public hearing on the seven and over unit issue, and it was quite clear at that hearing that some of the work was still incomplete, and we didn't want to begin the approval process. But the moratorium runs out July one, and it was very clear that the process would not be complete by the time the moratorium ran out, and when you add to the fact that we are basically consumed in June with budget hearings and budget and then over the summer we only have one meeting and a lot of interested parties are on vacation or not really paying attention we wanted to extend the moratorium to the end of the year but it is it's altogether possible that at our next public hearing we close the public hearing but then people want to come to council and speak on the issue in the affected neighborhoods and our feeling was we may not actually vote in council about it until after the summer mm -hmm. season when everybody's Sense. back but it doesn't necessarily mean the public hearing will stay open that long which is i think why councillor donald's saying we'll probably close the public hearing but it may not come here until the fall when everybody's paying attention again and not on vacation because i really do hate to do anything substantive in july and august because a lot of people aren't around and can't comment okay. can we first vote on the uh, the amendment please um any other discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of the amended? Aye. 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 Uh, and those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So the amendment passes. Now back to the original order. Um, and Council Murphy's explained the process. I understand you had an interesting ordinance meeting. So thank you all for your good I work. think it was very, it was very formative. Yeah. I think. And, and there's a little more work to be done, but I mean, it showed how public hearings are really part of the process and and the input from there really makes a difference yeah and I, I would just say um, it was encouraging in a sense that we can do more work in, in the same way and hopefully make more progress but we need more time now I'm gonna ask a procedural question of anyone who happens to know it does maybe just to be safe but does a, a moratorium require a roll call vote to be safe, to be safe. I think we, we should we can do it. Be safe. I'm just trying to. I, I call I'm, for a roll call. I do too. I'll second call that. Call, but does anyone know the answer to that question? Okay, good. That's fine. I'm not the only person yes, who doesn't know. I just, I hate to be the only idiot in the room. Probably so it's not. It's, probably it's, not a roll call. I, it would seem that it would. I don't think probably it would. It certainly required. has not been qualified as such. But there has been a roll call call for this for the moratorium. So. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Chair? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labar? Yes. Now, uh. Maybe just take the other two related, just so that. Yeah. To, so we don't have to you, have more conversation about the same items. Right. You, so you want to take. You're now the other, the other two items of the four. Yeah. That's your motion? To take the well, I don't. I don't well, know if I have a, to move that. I think we the can discretion just ask, of the chair to move. Just ask order. you to move those next, so that we don't have to vote on taking them out of order. Right. Okay. So, so this is this is two related. The two related ones that come up. This is uh, uh, to amend 350G. And that's a, uh, the G and H. Yep. And that's a replacement of moratorium and construction of seven units in the URB district with uh, language specified. And I know I, my question is it seems like we would table these or something because we're not going to approve them. Well, so we're, we're just voting to extend the, the moratorium. The moratorium. Right. This is the request. That's all we're doing is voting on that. We're just extending it again. To extend it. On, on these specific. We did, but, it, but I think oh. um, these, because these are G and H, mm -hmm. um, I, I understand your point. You're saying that there it would be moot, mm -hmm. but it doesn't hurt to go ahead and extend the moratorium on these. Oh, okay. Just to be safe. Well, I think originally 350 is the entire zoning ordinance. And because when we approved the changes that we did in the fall, the moratorium was in there. Right. So we amended the moratorium that's in the existing 350 right. to extend. We extend the moratorium that's currently in 350. And then I guess what we're doing here is extending the one specifically in the proposed changes, yeah. H, G, and H. Right. Yeah. 
But not enacting the pro proposal. No, it's just extending the moratorium. The, the moratorium is extended on this as well so that that. Um, Move the question. <laughs> I <laughs> second yes. that. Councilor, we're just moving it to a date certain. And yeah, we're confusing yeah. ourselves by the fact that it's a moratorium. We're just moving it to a date certain. Yes. It doesn't require a roll call vote. It's a debatable motion. That's it. Just, yeah, I make a motion to move it to a date certain. No, no. Second. Second. And the and the and the date certain, of course. Uh, yes, it's June fourth. So, uh, June June ninth. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. So the motions we made for both. And any further discussion on this? No. no, this is not a debatable motion. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now we're back to the regular order. This is to amend uh, Chapter 312-102, the Schedule 1 and the parking prohibition all times on State Street. And this is second. Mm -hmm. I second we know. Why can't we take group. the two? These two as a group, please. Yep. Yeah. So, the the group that you're referring to is to also about the meter the meters yeah, on exactly. Take them out so as a 312, group. 312, 102 and 312, 109 are related, same thing. We yeah. skipped one, but we'll come back we'll to come it. We'll come back to that. So the two state streets as a, as two a group. State streets. We're backing up. We have state street <laughs> and the parking meter zones. No, no, it's not your print. I think it's so you can go back to that. We'll, yeah, we'll go back to that. So, but okay. So we're now moving. The motion is to move as a group the two State Street parking prohibitions and meter removal. So moved. Second. It, it's already been made in second, hasn't it? As a group. Okay. All right. Second. Twice as good. And this is in second reading. Uh, this is in second reading. Any further discussion on this, Councilor Adams? Well, last time we were discussing this, my concern was that. Um, concern was taking my spots from the general public and the visitors and you know, and the fact that businesses rely on those spots to, so visitors can park there and um, and what I was wondering at that point was um, my questions were why we were moving them at that point um, there's there, there there are going to be likely changes to that intersection at a future point and um, I know the purpose is to is, to, is, is for decongestion but my, my question was, why don't we move, why don't we remove those spots closer to the point of construction so that the spots will be there and, and visitors will have access to them. Um, so I'm wondering if, if, uh, if there's anyone who wants to. Yeah, Councilor down. I'm, I'm happy to, to try and address that. I think that's a good question, um, as it was last time. And part of what you asked last time is when, you know, when will this intersection, when are we contemplating making these changes? It has to do with money. <laughs> hmm. um, and um, there's there's money in the you know in the, in the state bond bill and if it's released um, we could look at about a four year timeline until That's construction easy. might start if it's not um, it's maybe something like six years so that was the answer to your question um, but the answer to the question is raised now why do it now if it's six years off um, an argument would be in some ways it's more important to do now because if we made the changes uh, to the intersection that would improve traffic flow but that's not expected for a while nevertheless State Street is a bottleneck and if we remove these um, if we made space for a turning lane that improves traffic immediately and we're not gonna be waiting four to six years for those upgrades um, in terms of parking space replacement I can speculate a couple places where we might have new parking spaces here and there in the city um, I can't name parking spaces that would be right around the corner from that specific location. Um, I don't know where they would go. Are there any plans for new spaces? Um, for example, we're taking over part of Pleasant Street um, from the state. And so from Holyoke to Hockenham Road, um, it's conceivable that within a year we might have parking spaces there. Oh, but of course, that's now nowhere near this location. There's no specific plan. I mean, that's just a possible identification for potential future new spots at some point mm -hmm. oh. and um, you know, if I may again it's a it's a compromise between um, traffic flow and, and space and we all agree that parking spaces are precious and, and rare um, but it's a trade-off and I think by removing these spaces we solve about 75 percent of the problem on that corner because there's room for functionally for a right turn and it's right on red there anyway I think so so you'll be able to get to the corner and 
that solves the problem even before they redo the intersection. I think. So exactly. it's the immediate relief when they go. Councilor Klein. Um, I have to say that one of the kind of secret places that I always park is pretty close to there, and that is up um, up on Elm Street to the right there once you make the turn, so that there are actually parking spaces that are frequently available fairly close, and I think um, reducing that kind of bottleneck situation is, is pretty urgent, um, and I think that the trade-off of the parking spaces is worth it. Was well, a noble sacrifice in divulging your secret space. That's admirable. Uh, Council Labarge. I'm going to support this again for the second reading. Um, we've heard many, many complaints for many years. Councilor Carney, we've heard it. Councilor Dwight way back. And it's time. It's time to make a change there because it is bottlenecked. And I agree with Councilor Klein about up on Elm Street area. At some point, we have to make a change. And I think there is a safety there. And I think this move needs to be done. Uh, Council Shira. Um, obviously, this corner is of great concern and interest to me. Um, and so at last time, I had to the <coughs> point of making a right on red. And um, I'd asked about uh, whether this is going to cause further um, danger for pedestrians who are trying to cross in their crosswalk. Um, so if you are speeding up the traffic turning right on red, you're going to have less opportunity for people to cross there. So I don't mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can um, provide some information on that. Um, one point is there is a green arrow there to turn to turn right, and so if it is possible for more cars to make use of the green arrow rather than the right on red, then fewer cars using right on red, and we're making a better use of the of the normal procedure for turning turning right, which is right on green. So in that sense, I would think that would be an improvement for pedestrian safety. Um, beyond that, you know, it's Massachusetts. We have right on red. And if, if, in fact, it is a problem, which I, it, it may well be, then perhaps it's a problem we have now. Um, and then we should consider things like a no right on red sign, you know. Um, and the process for that I'm, I'm unclear about. But, but I think it's a legitimate concern. Um, I also think, and this is just speculative, but people, you know, you rush to get through there. If the cycle is reasonable and sane, then perhaps it's the case that, you know, like, oh, if I wait, I'll get through eventually. And, it's, they don't try to squeeze through, or you know, go through the church parking lot in this mad dash <laughs> to get terrible. through. That perhaps improve, improves pedestrian safety as well. Um, some thoughts. Yeah, I had an experience of being rear-ended by somebody there that was flying through the church parking lot, and I was on this. They came flying out of the parking, the, out of the driveway for the parking lot, like they were driving through the parking lot, like they're on State Street. So it, it's just, I'm glad we're going to address it because it, it, it'll help. And I agree, if it becomes a problem. Just make it no right on red there, and then people have to wait for the cycle so they don't cut the pedestrians off. Uh, I would ask that you consult with the DPW about the light timing because the gridlock potential. There's already what happens is you get a gridlock in that intersection where people, the light that that goes to Green Street, stops everyone dead in the they middle of that down. intersection, and and uh, that's a new cycle actually, and, and has created certain drama. Didn't that, didn't that cycle get changed for the articulated buses or something for, right. I yeah, think? It for, I don't know. Recently yeah. it did. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, it's a, it's a fine art that I don't profess to have any, any skills in at all. But okay, is there any further discussion on these two? Uh, roll call, please. Are you taking them as a group, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, let's see. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. I'd like to um, request that we take the next three as a. Mm -hmm. I just skipped over them. Well, that one, it's actually in twice. It comes up at the end. Oh, yes, it does. I'm sorry. It's coming around again. It's, it's I will second Councillor Barge's motion. The next three being to amend 312-102, that's Schedule 1 parking prohibition all times on Maple Street, and that's also uh, three, Chapter 312-104, uh, limited time parking on Maple Street, 
and then um, 312-117 on street and off street handicapped parking spaces on Maple Street. Move to refer to transportation and parking. Motion's been made to refer second. these three to transportation and parking and seconded. Any further discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Where's everyone on their bets here? I just, <laughs> not looking good. The next up is to amend uh, Chapter 350, Section 2.1, uh, Affordable Units. Move to refer to ordinance. And the motion's made to refer to ordinances for second. second. There's a second. Any discussion on the referral? <laughs> oh, open mic. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Have I missed anything? <laughs> one we missed came around twice. Yeah, it came around twice. So covered. That was covered. Um, I have no updates. I don't think. We've announced our public hearings and so on and so forth. Uh, are there any committee chairs that have any updates or announcements? Did you give me a report? I didn't give you a report. We did. I did. I did. So that that's uh, that announcement came early on. Um, so yeah, just to reprise that, there will be a public hearing for the budget uh, June. Is that June 9th? Not June 9th. Our next meeting is on less than hearing. June 5th. Yeah. June 5th at 7 or 5 p.m. Hearing Council Chambers. This is regarding the mayor's proposed FY20 budget. And please send me. Is it turned yet? Please send, <laughs> I'm just please, kidding. Okay. Please She's send me strong. your recommendations as to who you would like to see in budget hearings and uh, preferred dates if possible. Uh, Do you want those? I'm sorry? What did you just say? I would like. If you could send me the. The uh, department heads in the departments you would. No. Hello, counselor. I'm telling you. Somebody. If you would like to hear, if you would send to me your recommendations, the uh, departments that you'd like to hear from in the in the budget hearing, and then also dates that work for you. Right. I gave her the departments that I want, and I'll give you the dates. Oh, okay. Okay. This is great. Possible. Possible. All right. Is there any new business? I don't think so. I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. Second. Flip a coin. Yes. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Aye.